I removed the front wheel, the 19 inch spoked wheel assembly from the 2005 Dyna. You'll notice it's up on the lift, it has a center lift. We've strapped the bike down not only to the table lift, but also to the portable lift to make sure it's secure when you remove the front wheel assembly. I want to take a moment and just go over what Harley Davidson's considering the non serviceable wheel bearing. Although it's true, the sealed wheel bearing that they're using in today's motorcycles does not need any servicing. It is a sealed bearing. You have no way of accessing the internals of the bearing and lubricating them, cleaning them, repacking them with grease. The problem lies not with the bearing in service, but with the axle that passes through the bearing and retains the wheel in the front fork. As you can see on this axle, the darker area, right where the bearing would normally run when it's in the axle, is in the wheel in the motorcycle, that's where you create the problem of steel to steel corrosion, where the axle will actually lock itself onto the inner race of the sealed bearing. Again, they are not serviceable, but I do highly recommend at a regular interval, depending on the age of your motorcycle, how many miles you have on your motorcycle, or your particular riding style or riding conditions, that you take out the axle, whether it be front or rear, occasionally. Clean it good, get a good coat of anti-seize on the axle surface and reinstall it through the bearings. Problem with when the inner race of the bearing seizes to the axle, it's almost impossible to get it apart without damaging either the axle, the bearing, or the hub of the wheel. Over here to my left, I have a handful of bearings that were literally frozen to the axle. We were able to drive the axle out of the inner race, but then what happened, we discovered that the outer race itself was frozen to the aluminum hub on the rim. What this is known as is galvanic corrosion. When two dissimilar metals aluminum and steel in this case, are allowed to corrode together. They form a tight lock. The rust itself locks the race, the outer race of the bearing to the aluminum hub of the wheel. A lot of times you're able to do what we've done here and that's use some type of carbide rasp or cutting tool and physically slice the outer race in half. Once the inner race and the bearings have been removed. At that point you're able to use a punch and tap the inner race away from the aluminum hub on the wheel. You have to be very careful if you damage the outside dimension of the hub. Let's say you elongate it or you cause a lot of deep scars in it. It won't hold the ODID fitment of the hub and the outer race of the bearing correctly. The bearing will have a tendency to spin in the hub instead of staying stationary in the hub and allowing the bearing to spin on the inner race where the axle runs. There are a number of tools to remove these bearings correctly. Again, my definition of correctly is being able to perform a procedure without causing additional damage to surrounding or adjacent components. In this case, it would be the aluminum hub on the wheel or the axle. The bearing is a replaceable unit. They are available through Harley-Davidson as a matched set and you use your original center spacer. That sets not what's known as end play, 
because a true ball bearing does not have end play. But that keeps the two bearings spaced correctly in the hub. When you torque the axle down, the bearings don't draw on the inner race itself and cause a cocked position where the bearings running untrue inner race to outer race. This particular type of bearing removal tool is the one I use most common. Now they do make claw style pullers which go directly into the inner race. They expand and then you're able to pull from the inner race, remove the bearing from the hub. This type of puller basically works on the same concept. You insert it into the inner race. And what you do, you come from the other side of the wheel and engage the wedge piece into the puller mechanism. By driving the puller or the pusher part of the bearing remover into the drive piece, it spreads it open and allows it to grab the inner race of the bearing. And then you can just drive it out. You'll do the same procedure on the other side bearing. You need to use extreme caution. Anytime you're striking the end of a tool with a hammer. At this point, it's hard material against hard material. Wear safety glasses. A chip could come off of the tool and either injure you, enter one of your eyes, cause some type of eye damage, or injure someone that may be assisting you when you're replacing the bearings. First thing I like to do, I like to just get a good visual inspection of the wheel I'm working on. I like to look for any excessive corrosion. I like to make sure the bearings are spinning free in the hub. As you can see, these bearings are quite tight. They do have a few miles on them. It definitely warrants servicing or replacing the bearing. When I say servicing, the only thing you can do, get the axle out, clean up the inner race, get some anti-seize on the axle, and reinstall it. My take on this, if you're going to remove the wheel from the bike, you're able to get the axle out of the bearing without any damage or any extra effort. You typically anti-seize the axle, put it back in. If you loosen your axle and you find you can't get the axle out of the wheel, out of the fork assembly, out of the wheel, without having to drive it with a hammer, a brass punch, a number of ways you can push the axle through. Problem is, any time you start driving against the threaded portion of the axle, you physically mushroom over the end. What will happen, even though you can reinstall it, you can't thread the nut on the mushroomed end of the thread, and you can't torque it to correct specs. So if you damage the axle when you remove it, you need to replace the axle. If you need to drive the axle out of the wheel with that much force, I would replace the axle and the bearings as a unit. Let's take a look at removing these bearings from the 19-inch spoked wheel with aluminum hub. I'll insert the tool into the bearing I want to remove. I can then flip the wheel over. I like to work on a block of wood. I can then insert the driver, make sure it lines up in the open groove of the remover. Of course, safety glasses. This is one of those instances where the bigger the hammer, the better. You want to make definitive blows with the hammer. You want whatever effort you're applying to the removal tool to go directly to the bearing and shock it loose.
I'll get the installer driven securely into the remover tool. At this point, I always like to work with an extra set of hands. Problem is, you've got to stand this up on the blocks of wood. You want to make sure, looking from the bottom, that you don't have the bearing pinched in the blocks of wood. And that you have the blocks of wood as close to the center of the bearing as possible. I'm working on the other side of the rotor, so it's not a concern. I don't have to be concerned about bending the rotor when I hit this particular bearing out of the hub. Second set of hands always holds things stationary. And then you want to give it a good shot. At that point, you can see the puller tool released from the inner race before it grabbed the inner race, removed the bearing from the hub. When that happens, it typically tells you the bearing is frozen in the hub. It may be difficult, more difficult than just driving it out. So what you want to do, remove the collet or the driver piece of the tool. I like to put back into the inner race and put the wheel assembly on the concrete floor. I don't want to lose any of my hammering motion through the surface of the bench. Now that the wheel is on the concrete floor, I have my safety glasses on. I've installed the driving handle of the remover into the collet on the other side. I'm going to tap it in until it's good and solid. And now we can try it again. We'll block it up on wood and we'll try and drive that frozen bearing out of the wheel. Same thing applies with the wood. If you work up on a bench, you do lose some of the push power or the driving power of the swing of the hammer through deflection in the bench top. When you're on a hard concrete surface, every blow of the hammer goes directly to the driver tool. Make sure you set your blocks of wood as far in as you can to support it as strongly as you can without interfering with the bearing as it comes out of the hub. And you can hear that time as I drove the bearing out, it was a nice solid hit. I didn't lose any of the energy from the swing of the hammer through the deflection of the workbench top. Once again, you can see the collet slid by the inner race of the bearing, but I do see the bearing started to move. All you can really do, set the collet again, get it to lock in on the bearing, and try the driver tool again. Again, they make a number of pullers. This particular system is the one that I find works the best. Having attempted to remove the bearing two, three times from the non-disc side of the hub without any luck, I now want to go to the disc side. You need to be very careful on the rotor side of the wheel. You don't want to bend the rotor. Chances are if one bearing won't come out, the other one will. If you're able to get one of the two bearings out, 
You can remove the center spacer and then work through the hub of the wheel to drive the other frozen bearing out from the opposite side of the wheel. Again, keep your blocks of wood as close to the center as you can. Try not to cause any excess pressure on the rotor assembly itself. I tried with the remover once. I'm going to try it one more time. Make sure the collet is sunk into the bearing good. Make sure you're not applying any unnecessary pressure to the rotor. As you can see, both of these bearings are very frozen into the hub. The next option we have, we'll use the same driver tool, but what we'll do, we'll get a small propane torch and we'll heat up the non-rotor side of the hub. I've tried on this 19 inch front wheel assembly twice on each side of the hub to remove the sealed bearing Obviously, they are frozen into the aluminum hub. At this point, the only way I know, or at least that I prefer to try next, is to heat the outer portion of the hub, the aluminum, hope the aluminum will expand away from the steel race on the bearing, and allow us to grab it with the collet and drive it out. Now, although there are many schools of thought when it comes to heating metal components, yes, it's true if you heat the outer diameter of an aluminum hub, you're also heating the hardened outer race. Depending on which metal expands quicker due to the heat, you may lock the inner race 
which is hardened steel, tighter to the aluminum hub. Let's say aluminum doesn't expand as quick as hardened steel. So in theory, by heating the aluminum hub, the hub should come away from the race. But if the race expands at a quicker rate than the aluminum hub, wouldn't you think it would get tighter as the race expands in the hub? That is true. You're not so much looking for expansion and contraction capabilities of a typical metal. What you're looking for is to overcome the galvanic corrosion that's created between the two dissimilar metals, aluminum and hardened steel, by heating it up, allowing both metals to expand at their normal expansion rate, and then cooling momentarily as you install the remover tool, what it does, it allows the aluminum and the hardened steel to move away from each other just enough to release that bond that the galvanic corrosion or the rust has created. Be aware, I wore safety glasses. Be aware, I didn't overheat the hub where I can compromise the integrity of the spokes. The spokes on this wheel are all cool. The hub, obviously, I can't touch. The driver handle is cool, but the press plug, you can't touch because the heat transferred from the hot bearing right out the press plug. Heat wants to chase cold. It's just the way things work. So by heating it, we were able to release the rusted bond or the galvanic corrosion bond. The bearing was released. I won't grab it with my bare hands, although I have. I'll set it aside, let it cool. I'm really in no hurry to remove the tool from the bearing. You'll also have to use caution. The inner spacer will be hot. The inner spacer, even though it's not in theory directional, I would clearly mark it. Mark, can you hand me a permanent marker, please? I will clearly mark it the direction that it was in. I'll put an arrow down with an R, which tells me the spacer was downwards towards the rotor. Again, it's hot. Wear gloves. Use a shop rag. Don't grab anything hot. Don't get hurt. While the hub is still warm, I like to wipe out the inner surface. I want to make sure I didn't cause any damage, whether it be marks, scratches, whether the hardened steel race bit into the aluminum and dragged some of the aluminum out when the bearing came out. You don't want any damage to the hub. This is a crucial area of the motorcycle. The wheel rotates. If you're driving 100 miles an hour, that wheel and axle is spinning at enormous rate of speed. You don't want to compromise the integrity of the hub, the spokes, the rim, the tire, the inner spacer. Obviously, the bearing can never be reused. Anytime you heat any type of bearing, whether it's a tapered Timken, which is what we're used to seeing before the non-serviceable sealed bearing. The tapered Timken had a rubber seal. You'd take it out, you'd pack it with some grease, put it back in, it was normal service. You can't do that with these bearings. Anytime you heat any bearing, roller bearing, needle bearing, these sealed bearings, you destroy the integrity of the bearing by exposing it to a higher temperature than it was designed for. With the non-rotor side of the hub bearing removed, if you look in through the hub, you can clearly see the edge of the rotor side wheel bearing. It's typically why I prefer to get this side bearing out first. That way there I don't run the risk of damaging the rotor if I have to use excessive force or even heat to remove the bearing on the rotor side. At this point, 
Now that we've got that bearing out, the center spacer out, there's a number of ways, right down to a chisel, a flat brass punch, a drift punch and a hammer. All you really need to do is tap that bearing all along the circumference of the inner race and you'll eventually rock it away. I try to never heat a rotor. Typically rotors that are exposed to heat that they're not supposed to warp. Once a rotor's warped, it's no longer usable. I'll have Mark move the table out of the way. Again, this wheel being as difficult as it is, obviously it's, it's, the bearings are as frozen as they are. I think it's best we work on the hard concrete floor. Always good to have that second set of hands. Make sure you're parallels. In this case, they're two by fours. I don't like to use steel parallels hard against hard. The rotor is hard. This wood is soft. I do want a little bit of give when I'm trying to remove the bearing on the rotor side. You want to space your parallels or your two by fours as close to the outer diameter of the race of the bearing as possible. You want to distribute the hammering motion across the hub, not across the rotor. Safety glasses are a must. Comes to this procedure, I do prefer brass. Again, it's soft against hard. You've got a hard hammer, a soft punch, a hardened inner bearing race. Always have your second set of hands. Hold the rim in place. Make sure they're wearing safety glasses. Don't hurt someone that's helping you repair your motorcycle. The second set of hands can also shine a flashlight and it'll give you a good clear view as you start to tap. And again, don't try to drive that bearing out all from one side. All you'll do is tip it in the hub and start to drag aluminum of the hub out with the bearing race. Work at one point, move 180 degrees to the other side, move 90, move 180 away from the 90. Keep working around in small increments till that bearing comes free from the hub. After getting the first bearing to move, removing the other bearing on the rotor side almost seems like child's play. Just as an example of the amount of heat that I applied to the non-rotor side to get that bearing free from the hub, this bearing that I just drove out with the brass punch on the rotor side is warm to the touch. That tells me as I was heating the opposite side, the heat transferred through the hub, through the outer dimension of the bearing, the outer race, through the ball assembly of the bearing, through the inner race, through the spacer, traveled all the way down the spacer and started to warm up the bearing on the other side. So again, Use heat, use it in moderation, but use it in enough to heat up the surface of what you're trying to remove. You don't want to heat something. Bang on it. Let it get cold. Heat it again. You want to try and apply enough heat to get the job done the first time. With both of the old bearings removed from the 19-inch rim,
We cause no damage to the aluminum hub, the spokes, the rim, the tire, or the rotor. I want to reinstall two new Harley bearings with the original center spacer. Again, there are a number of puller tools, a number of methods that you can use to remove these particular types of sealed wheel bearings. This way I showed you is the most common. These are common hand tools that most everyone will have access to. If you can afford to buy a correct, again, what you consider correct, is dictated by how much damage you cause when you're doing a particular procedure. If you can afford to buy one of the specialty pullers, or if you happen to have enough work to justify the cost of a specialty puller, by all means, buy the puller, try it. But if you're working at home, try to use what's readily available. Use a number of combinations. Use things that you're not going to get in trouble with. Use things that aren't going to cost you a lot. If you have to spend a couple hundred dollars on a specialty puller, you're probably better off just to take the wheel off the motorcycle, bring it to a local shop or a local dealer who has the specialty puller, just pay them to swap the bearings for you. When we're reinstalling the bearings, I always like to install the non-rotor side first. What we'll do here, I'll have Mark give me a hand. I'll use a large diameter socket. This socket will fit over the hub, but yet land between the rotor hardware. Again, you need two sets of hands. You need to work with a partner. I can send a threaded rod with a nut on one end completely through the hub. I can then put one of the new bearings. Again, like any bearing, you want to try to press or drive against the race that has the manufacturer's ID on it, whether it's part number or the manufacturer's name. This is the side of the bearing should be pressed on. I myself do not like to drive bearings. Two reasons. One, you give a hammering motion to a brand new bearing set, which probably isn't good for the life of the bearing. And number two, if you happen to slip and damage the seal on the sealed bearing, it pretty much renders that brand new bearing useless. I wouldn't trust it in normal operating conditions. I can now just make sure the bearing is started by hand. It's sitting in the hub square. I can then find a similar socket which lines up exactly with the outside dimension of the bearing. Anytime you're pressing, driving, or hammering a bearing into place, never drive against the inner race. What you're doing, you're creating a force. The bearing's being held in place by the outer race, and you're forcing the inner race through the bearing to drive the outer race into the hub. You don't want to do that. I use the larger dimension socket, which lines up exactly with the OD of the bearing. I've then got a collet here that fits inside the socket it gives us a nice centered position on the threaded rod. I'll start by putting my nut on and thread it on the threaded rod until the collet makes contact with the nut and the socket. And the socket makes contact with the outside race of the bearing. Again, make sure that bearing is started straight. If it looks a little tipped, Take a moment and just gently tap. You can see I'm barely touching it. All I'm doing is squaring it up in the bore. I'll have Mark hold his side. Make sure that other side on the rotor 
is not driving against any of the rotor hardware. And then I can just start to gently spin my side. Now this, like any bearing, it is a press fit. But if you find you have to apply excessive pressure, chances are either you have the wrong bearing, you may have dimensionally wrong hub to bearing. Even though the bearing may be labeled correctly, I would definitely check to make sure ODID, even if you have to measure with a micrometer, there should be a certain amount of interference fit. I'm sure you can look into any machinist manual. They'll give you a rough idea if you have an aluminum hub with an outside dimension of two inches and you have a bearing with an outside, or you have an aluminum hub with an ID of two inches and you have a bearing with an outside dimension of two point such and such dimension. That'll leave you a certain amount of tolerance, interference, as the bearings pulled into the hub. Again, use common sense. If you really have to work to put this in place, something's wrong. You can see I'm not applying much pressure, and the bearing's just going right into the hub. I definitely do not like to use heat when installing new bearings. You never want to heat a new bearing. You'll take the life of the new bearing right out of it. And what you basically want to do, run that bearing in until it just seats. You'll see everything will come to a stop. Don't give it another half a crank. Don't give it the old college try. Let's make sure it's really seated. Chances are you'll break off the thin lip on the inside of the hub. Once that bearing is seated, I can then loosen the nut on the threaded rod. Always nice to have that second set of hands. You don't have to worry about anything slipping away, possibly damaging the chrome on the rim. With everything removed, I want to lay the rim down. I want to just give it a visual inspection. Make sure that that seal is not disturbed in any way. And you can see how easily this new bearing spins. I could barely spin the original bearing that was in this rim. It was definitely due to be replaced. And a lot of times with these sealed bearings, it's not until you're due for a tire change or you happen to buy a mag wheel or a replacement wheel for your motorcycle that you encounter this corrosion issue where the axle's frozen in the bearing or the bearing's frozen in the hub. I mean, it's all fine and well if you're going to replace the rim. The rim should come with new bearings. You're never going to remove the old ones from your factory rim, install them in a new rim. But if you happen to be taking the tire off the motorcycle, the rim and tire as an assembly, off the motorcycle to install a new tire because the tire is worn out and you can't get the axle out of the inner race of the bearing, you are at a crossroads where you need to address replacing both the bearings. At that point, you leave yourself no option. The tire's bald, it needs to be replaced. You need to get the tire as an assembly out of the fork. In order to do that, you need to remove the axle from the bearing. You need to replace the bearings. Don't just beat the hell out of the axle, mushroom over the threaded end, and say, well, I got it apart. All I need is a new axle. What you did, you destroyed the integrity of the bearing by driving the axle out, applying excess pressure on the inner race of the bearing. With that said, Bearings installed on the non-rotor side of the hub. I'm going to flip the rim over. I'm going to make sure I do not forget to install my factory spacer. Although this doesn't set end play, what this does, it keeps the torque pressure of the axle 
solely on the inner race of the bearing. If you were to assemble this without an inner spacer at all, let's just say you forgot to put the spacer into the hub, pressed or drove both your new bearings into the hub, installed it on the bike, inserted the axle, torqued it to factory specs, the wheel wouldn't spin at all. What you've done is you've drawn excessive pressure on both inner races of the bearings, and what you've done, you've taken that ball assembly that the entire race depends on to roll freely, and you've driven them both inward. What you've actually done is you've jammed the ball of the ball bearing against the race. It's not going to work properly. Again, it's a major safety issue. If you're not comfortable doing this at home, whether it's with a specialty puller or with regular homemade tools, let's call them, or commonly found tools around the garage, by all means, pay to have a professional do it. Don't get hurt just because you're trying to save a couple bucks on such a critical component. We're on the rotor side of the hub. Factory spacer. We marked it with an arrow and an R. That spacer should install this way. Make sure that spacer drops all the way down. Make sure it's not sitting pitched inside the hub where the axle won't go straight through it. You can then start your other new bearing, always working from the numbered or the manufactured lettered side of the bearing. Same thing will apply. You can lightly tap the outer race just to make sure the bearing gets started square. Again, by all rights, if you were to take this socket, which is outside dimensionally matched to the bearing, you could put this socket on this and you could drive this with a hammer and send it home. I do not like to apply a jarring motion to a bearing, whether it be outside race, inner race, the seal surface, I just don't think there's any place for hammering a bearing into a component. With the rotor side bearing started straightly into the hub, I can then use one of the collets that I have on the threaded rod, feed it through the new bearing we installed. You'll see this collet just touches the outside dimension of the bearing. I have my second set of hands always helping me. I'll do the same thing. I'll use the socket that is dimensionally correct with the outer race of the bearing. I'll use this collet that I have that fits inside the socket to center it on the threaded rod. You know, again, it's important to have a nice clean piece of threaded rod. If there was a bunch of burrs on this and you weren't able to thread this nut on easy by hand, when you were tightening it to draw the bearing into the hub, you really wouldn't be sure if it was the interference of the threaded rod or if you were having issues pushing or threading the bearing into the hub. It's a very important time to get a good view at what you're doing. Make sure the collet or the socket or the piece of pipe, whatever you're using on the non-rotor side, the bearing we already installed, is only pressing on the outer race of the bearing. You don't want to damage the bearing you already installed in order to install the bearing on the rotor side. Same thing will apply. Mark will hold his end of the threaded rod in place and I'll gently start to spin the bearing with the socket and the collet on the threaded rod. You can see I'm not using a lot of pressure. 
That bearing is just going right in as if it should. This tells us a couple things. The bearing is straight. The IDOD fitment between the hub and the outer race of the bearing is correct for a press fit. You can't just push it in by hand, but you also don't need to force it into the aluminum hub. And thirdly, what it tells us is that this tool works pretty good for a combo of sockets and threaded rod. You really shouldn't have to fight to install bearings. You want to put that into place until it just stops. Now it's not going to stop against the shoulder in the hub. What it's going to stop against is the ID of the inner race, the inner race on the bearing to the OD of the axle spacer inside the hub. Make sure everything's seated. You definitely don't want that center spacer bouncing around between the bearings. And you don't want that final little bit between the center spacer and the two inner races of the bearings to be drawn together by the torque of the axle when you install it on the motorcycle. You'll know you did something wrong, whether it's front wheel or rear wheel. You'll know something is drastically wrong if you go and put the wheel back in the motorcycle and your brake caliper doesn't line up to the rotor the way it did. What that means is the whole bearing pack in the hub is offset either to the left or to the right depending on where the rotor is in relation to the brake pad in the caliper. At that point what you need to do is move the entire bearing pack where it needs to be long. Again, you're probably in a little bit of trouble at that point. If you think you're going to get in trouble, a nice way to work, again, laying a trail of breadcrumbs while you're working, take a few measurements before you even attempt to remove the stock bearings. Run a straight edge across the rotor, get a feeler gauge. You can even use a depth gauge, a micrometer depth gauge and measure how many thousandths of an inch that bearing is set into the hub, both on the rotor side and the non-rotor side. Write down these measurements. Check them after you install the bearings. Make sure those bearings are running exactly where they were before you replace them. At this point, you want to make sure that center spacer is nice and snug between the two new bearing inner races. You want to make sure both bearings spin free. You definitely want to take a little light, I, I hate to use the word sandpaper. I would prefer some type of scotch pad, even a light, light, fine emery cloth. Make sure you remove any of the corrosion on the axle. Apply a liberal coat of anti-seize. And then you're really ready to reinstall the wheel, tire assembly with the serviced axle, new bearings, back into your motorcycle.